Good morning. Good morning. We are so glad to be here worshiping with everyone today. We just ask to worship with us, sing with us, clap, pray, and you'll feel God's power. I promise. everyone's in red we're all we all chose to wear red and today we've added red to our cross and that's because today is Pentecost Sunday and so we're going to learn about that more during the message but for you kids to understand and maybe some adults that don't know Pentecost Sunday is the day that Christ promised after his ascension that the Holy Spirit would come that the Holy Spirit would rain down on them and I don't think they expected what happened kids because what happened was is, is they were in the, this room this place and all of a sudden people from all around started hearing thundering sounds and lightning bolts and seeing all these crazy things noises they just couldn't even understand and they started hearing all these people talking different languages like if you heard someone over here talking in Spanish and you know what they were saying and someone in German and someone in Hebrew and all these different languages but all of these people who were in this city from different places began to hear their foreign tongue being spoken and heard about Jesus Christ and heard about the Holy Spirit so God made it possible that they would hear the story 
And so we're going to talk about that during the message today. But last night, Boone was running around the house with a balloon. And he had found it outside because they had played water balloons. And he found it outside and it was flat. And he, no matter how hard he blew and blew and blew, he just couldn't get it to blow up. Well, the flap was kind of folded together and it just wouldn't pull apart. And so when I pulled it apart, he pushed some air into it and it started blowing up. And he said it came to life. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. We walk around trying to do our own thing every day. and We believe in Jesus, but sometimes we just don't call on Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit comes along and says, here you go. Let me give you some life. Let me breathe some life into you. And let me show you the power that God gave, gives to us. And so we're going to talk about that power today. So I just want you to understand why you see all the red. And when you hear the word Pentecost, that that's the day the church was born. So all those years ago, that's the day that the church as a whole was born. So before we go into our offering time, I've moved the offering bucket. Before we go into our offering time, I want to call us for just a minute to a special time of prayer. Um, our nation is in distress right now, not just reeling from over 100,000 deaths from COVID-19, um, those on the front line still fighting the virus, this unseen enemy, and now we have this other virus coming, this, this virus of hatred and racism and injustice. And so I want to call us to just a moment, a time of prayer today to lift some special people up. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, as unrest and unruliness revolves in our world today, looting and acts of violence, all stemming from another act of violence, we ask, gracious God, that you pour your peace down, that this nation would fall on their knees in prayer, and that if just two or three are gathered, God, you say you're there. So we call this nation to prayer. We call those in this sanctuary to prayer. We call those within the sound of my voice to prayer. We call your people to prayer, God. We lift up today the family of George Floyd. We lift them up, gracious God, in their pain and in their suffering and in this, this death that has now become a nation's name, a nation's son. We lift them up to you today, God. We lift up those that are feeling and fearing and living in injustice and race and prejudice and hatred. No matter their color of skin, God, they are all your children. And so we lift them up today, wherever they are. We pray for the law enforcement that is on the front line, those first responders that are trying to call the people back. God, we pray for them and for their safety. God, we pray for those law enforcement and first responders that took the oath to serve and protect all. And we ask you to be with them, God. We also pray for those law enforcement and first responders that have fallen away from that oath, God. We ask you to bring their hearts back and to put them in your eyes, God, so they see all people as your children. God, we ask that you be with each and every one of us today that lives in this land as we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. Fill this land today, God, with your love, your peace, and your grace. As we celebrate this church and this community of faith, we ask, God, that the, the tithes and the offerings that are sent in, whether laid in this plate, sent by mail, paid online, however they come in, we ask for those hearts that give them, God, not just to be cheerful, but to receive the blessings over and beyond for the ways that they walk in faith and give to your church. We ask that these offerings be multiplied to benefit and build your kingdom wherever you call us to serve. We ask all this in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Sings my song, my 
I could just go on worshiping all day. Mm. Amen. Our scripture today comes out of Acts. We began in Acts 1 last week, and as I reminded you, we read out of the end of Luke, and then Luke talks about the ascension at the end of Luke, the end of his gospel, and then opens it up again and in the beginning of Acts. And so today we move to Acts 2. So let's, let's read the word of the Lord today. When the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard one after another their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, all those, you know, all those we're just not even going to try to try to do there. Um, even Cretans and Arabs. They're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? Others joked they're drunk on cheap wine. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's kind of like a name. I listen to it. I know I'm going to say it wrong, so there's just no point trying. Let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious and holy God, we thank you that even in our shortnesses and our weaknesses and our failings, you are still God. And we thank you for the ways that you move among us and within us and around us. So we ask you today with the sending of the Holy Spirit to blow this roof off today. To send your message, to pour it in this place, to go out into homes, to cars, to businesses, to whoever is listening, gracious God, that they would feel the mighty wind of the Holy Spirit on their neck, in their ears, around their bodies, that God, they would feel your presence today as never before. God, we ask all this in your son's redeeming name. Amen. Amen. So every time I read this scripture, I have to laugh because... I just, I have to laugh when it gets to the part that people think they were drunk. Um, because I think back to a time, um, not a whole lot of people know this, but when I was a little girl, my mother and my grandmother had me in the pageant circuit. And they took me all over. We traveled all over the United States chasing crown after crown after trophy after trophy. And I started probably when I was about three and was in my last pageant when I was about 10. And so we went everywhere. Well, I can remember strawberries have always been my very favorite food. I will take strawberries over anything. I will take strawberries over a steak. I'll take strawberries over chocolate. I'll take strawberries over any food you put in front of me. I'm going to pick the strawberries every time. And so when I was little, one of the men that, that kind of traveled with the pageant circuit and served as security, his name was Garfield, nicest largest African-American man I think I've ever seen in my whole life, and he was our pageant area's bodyguard. And so he kind of traveled with us and made sure we stayed safe. And so he would always bring me, when we would get to the hotel, he would always make sure that I had a bunch of strawberries in my room because he knew how much I loved them. And so one day after the pageant was over and we were packing up to leave, we went downstairs to this very, very nice, posh hotel. And so we're downstairs, and they had this huge breakfast bar laid out for all of the contestants. And I went over, and I got my own plate. You know, we're doing pictures, and I have my crown on, and we have our robes on, and, you know, all this kind of goofy stuff. And so that now I look at it and think it's really goofy. But anyway, so I go, and I get this huge plate of strawberries, and I just eat them, and eat them, and eat them, and eat them. And I go back for a second plate, the second plate. And after a little while, I'm so tired, just so very, very tired. And so I said, I have to go lay down for a little bit. So my grandmother, who I called Mamo, took me up to our room as they were coming to, the bellhop was coming to load our stuff up, and I laid down and took a nap. The only thing I remember is seeing the picture of me laying on the bed just drunk. 
because they were champagne soaked so strawberries. <laughs> and I was toasted as a six year old. Toasted. And so I'm not sure what I said, and thank God there wasn't FaceTime or video or anything like that back in that day, because those that would probably live to haunt me, I can just tell you right now. So I think about that when I read this scripture, because all these people are filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in different languages, these native tongues, God making certain that everyone in the area could hear the message of Jesus Christ. God making certain that no matter what word was spoken, people were going to get it. And so it was, it was not crazy drunk talk, but that's what the non-believers wanted people to think. They're just crazy. They're just crazy. But they weren't. And so Peter's Pentecost sermon is, is not primarily about the coming of the Holy Spirit. I, I want you to hear that as, as we go through this. It's not necessarily about the Holy Spirit. It's mostly about Jesus. Peter steps up in his very first sermon. The same Peter who sunk under water, the same Peter who denied Jesus, that Peter steps up to preach his first sermon. And I can tell you as a pastor, he was shaken in his in his knickers, I can just tell you. Shaken, because he was probably so nervous. But he steps up there, and with the power of God and the Holy Spirit, he delivers this Pentecost sermon, demonstrating the winds and the tongues and, and the fire that made people speak out in these different languages. His speech is quite ordinary. I'll just tell you, it's, it wasn't spoken in a slur, drunken tongue. It talks about how it was calm and collected, but purposeful. So how does a matter-of-fact speech like this lead 3,000 people that day? If you go on and you read the scripture and you read the story, by the end of his message, 3,000 people came to Christ that day. 3,000 people reoriented their lives, and they aligned themselves with the Messiah to join the church. The crucified and risen Messiah and added to the number that day through their Christian baptism. So I want to break down kind of what Peter said that, that changed just so many lives here. So God accredits Jesus to the descendants of Israel. And he does that by the miracles and the wonders and the works and the signs. And so with God's foreknowledge of, of, God's, of his plan, how, how Jesus was going to be handed over, he was going to be beaten, he was going to suffer, he was going to be crucified, he was going to die, he was going to be buried, and he was going to be risen from the dead. With all of that knowledge, knowing that Jesus was going to be freed from the permanent grips of death, Peter and all of this assembly there today, like all of you, are witnesses to these divine acts. You become a witness when you read this scripture, knowing anything about the Bible, knowing anything about the Gospels, because you know that's what the four Gospels are, Jesus' life. It tells all about Jesus. And Peter walks with him. Peter knows. And Peter knows he's become a witness to this. And in you knowing the story, and then you being told the story again at Pentecost, you are a witness to these signs and these wonders. And God knows that as he has exalted Jesus to his right hand, he knows now from this exalted place, Jesus pours out his Holy Spirit. The evidence of which Peter tells his audience, you've all witnessed it. You've been here. In other words, I kind of hear Peter saying, you got no excuse now. No excuse. You know the whole story now. You know why he came. You know what he did when he was here. You know how they took him out. And you know how God brought him back. Now you better go tell people. That's what I hear Peter saying. Because what it says is that in the giving of Jesus Christ, God anticipates this great coming on this glorious day when it says Jesus will come back just like he ascended, as we talked about last week. He's ascended up into the clouds, and the men tell the disciples, why are you still watching? He's not there anymore, but he'll come back just like you saw him go up. And so on that great day, the Lord says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter's story of salvation sounds so much like our Apostles' Creed, doesn't it? So much like our Apostles' Creed that he tells them, he came in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He was crucified, he was died, and he was resurrected. And it even mentions in verse 31 of the reference to hell. It, it references Hades. Now you think back, there's, the, there's a lot of versions of the Apostles' Creed, but the ecumenical version states that Jesus was crucified, died, and buried, and descended to the dead. So Paul, uh, Peter is telling them all of this, and he's mentioning 
hell. He's reminding them of the story all along. Just as I stand here and remind you about Acts 1 that we talked about last week in the Ascension, Peter's reminding them in this sermon the entire story. And he tells them in there that all who are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ will receive the Holy Spirit. They will receive this power. Now, in his gospel, Luke associates the Holy Spirit with the church's witness. And so I want you to hear what Luke says there. Because he talks about the church's witness and kind of how Jesus has said it. He says, Jesus said to them, it is written that the Christ would be killed and rise from death on the third day. You saw these things happen. You are witnesses. You must go and tell people that they must change and turn to God, which will bring them forgiveness. You must start from Jerusalem and tell the message in my name to the people of all nations. Remember that I will send you the one that the Father promised. Stay in the city until you are given that power from on high. And then again in Acts, Luke says it again. He tells them the story. He says one time when Jesus was eating, he told them not to leave Jerusalem. He said, wait here until you receive what the Father promised to send. Remember, I told you about it before. John baptized people with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The apostles were all together. They asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time for you to give the people of Israel their kingdom? Jesus said the Father is the only one who has the authority to decide dates and times. They are not for you to know, but the Holy Spirit will come on you and give you power. You will be my witnesses. You will tell people everywhere about me, in Jerusalem, in the rest of Judea, in Samaria, and in every part of the world. That scripture, if you were listening last week, should sound familiar because that is our scripture from last week. But today we pick out that word witnesses. So in this sermon, Peter's telling us all, we're all witnesses to Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, and the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised. Now, without the Holy Spirit, no amount of eloquence, no amount of emotion, no words you put out will mean anything. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, a simple word of testimony works wonders. It brought 3,000 people. It's not our power, y'all. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that moves people. Going back, Luke makes a point and he he wants us to understand that all believers are part of the church's spirit witness. Part of that spirit-empowered witness calling others to come to the name of the Lord. So in the second chapter of his book, the prophet Joel tells us something. And then again, Paul tells us the same in Romans 10. And then Luke tells us in his gospel. And then Peter says it again here in Pentecost in Acts 2. So it says, all that call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So let me tell you something. I used to hear my daddy say all the time, when you hear something repeated in the Bible over and over and over again, you better listen because God's got something to teach you. God's got something of major importance that he needs you to hear. The repeated message here is that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Say everyone. Everyone. Everyone Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It does not say, I want you to hear me on this and get this. It does not say men or women. It does not say Methodist or Baptist. It does not say saints or sinners, divorced or single, rich or poor, gay or straight, black, white, yellow, red, green. It says everyone. Everyone. We need to realize that as Christians, this message did not come from Jesus just for those who believe. He came for the whole world. The whole world. And then hear me on this. Christians, as believers, we are held to a higher standard. A higher standard to offer the witness and the salvation of Jesus Christ to every person we come in contact with. Every person. That means everyone. And we are held to a higher standard because we know. We have stepped up and we have said we believe. Jesus says, you are my witnesses. Now you think about that. When a crime happens and you have witnessed it and people know you've witnessed it, you have the option to take the opportunity to step up and tell the truth. If you don't, they will summon you, right? They will subpoena you to step in and tell the truth. Now you can sit there and claim whatever amendment, right? I'm sure somebody would tell me what this, the fifth amendment, to plead the fifth whatever and not say anything. But are you offering the truth? If you say nothing, are you offering the truth? The Bible says the truth will set us free. And there are people that need to be set free. 
I don't care who they are. I don't care where they live. I don't care how they live. I don't care what they do. They have the same grace that we do. Amen. The same grace, the same God. Peter starts his speech and he ends his speech with salvation. Peter says and promises the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he says that if, that if you just call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And he concludes his, his message to them by imploring the members of his audience to save themselves from this wicked generation. Save yourselves. And at the end of that message, 3,000 people came to the Lord. 3,000 people gave up where they were living, uh, li how they were living and turned to Jesus Christ and became children of the Most High God. Received the power of the Holy Spirit and became empowered witnesses. You are all witnesses. Each and every one of you that call in the name of the Lord. So here's my question to end with today. Do you know the salvation of Jesus Christ? Do you know that Christ was crucified, died, and risen just for you? Do you know that if you do not or have not been told the story of salvation, there is grace for you today and every day? If you don't know someone that knows the story of salvation, Call me. Look me up. Send me a message. I'll call you. I'll, whatever. You deserve to know the story of salvation. I don't care who you are, how you are, where you live, how old you are. I don't care. The story of salvation, Jesus went to the cross for you. Amen. Not just for me. For you. Jesus went to the cross not just for those that go to church. For you. You deserve God's grace. It is given freely to you. So if you do know the story of salvation... What kind of witness are you being? Jesus calls us to be witnesses. Joel said we were witnesses. Peter says we're witnesses. Paul says we're witnesses. What kind of witness are you being? And are you using your witness to build the kingdom? We're not here to build up our own lives, God, people. We're here to build up the life of God in others. That's what we're called to do, to build the kingdom. And the kingdom is in here. So we can go out and take the kingdom to every person we come in contact. So it's those, those English questions I'm going to ask you, the what, where, when, how, and why. What are you doing to build the kingdom? What are you doing? Where are you doing it? Where are you building the kingdom? How? How are you doing it? Why are you doing it? When are you doing it? Where are you being a witness for Jesus Christ? Because if you turn the news on, there's a lot of people in the world that needs to hear it. There is a lot of people that needs to hear about Jesus Christ. Peter made the story about the story. Salvation. You get salvation, there comes the Holy Spirit. It's all about salvation. Who are you offering the salvation to today? Guys, we don't have to go to the cross. It's been done. But we do have to tell about the one that went to the cross. That's what we're called to do, to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. So are you telling everyone the story of salvation? Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, as we gather together as witnesses to your love, your mercy, and your grace, we ask that you fill us with not just the power of the Holy Spirit, but a courageous power, God, that you will show us and our eyes will be opened of the who, what, where, when, and why. Because, God, that's what we're here to do, to build your kingdom here on earth until we gather together in your kingdom in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. So, God, may we leave this place today empowered by the Holy Spirit. God, whether it's three or 300 or 3,000, may you throw those people at us that need to know about the love and grace of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of God that falls upon us. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen.
You've seen the mobs of people uh, just in the streets. I'm not talking about the looting or the, the, the riot. The mobs in the streets. It all started with one person walking out and saying, this is what we're going to do, and people followed. Be that one person that gets them to follow Christ. Yes. Be that one person that starts a revolution for Jesus Christ. Be that yes. one person that stands up and says, not today, Satan. Yes. Be the one person that sets the world on fire. Amen. Amen. Go in peace today. Set your church on. 